What's up everybody, welcome back to another video. And in today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at my newest piece, Internal Resolve. Um, I'm gonna be going back to my traditional three-part deconstruction series, where um, the first part, I kind of dissect the theory behind the music. Uh, the second, we're gonna talk about the arrangement and the orchestration. And in the final part, we're gonna talk about the mixing and the processing behind the piece. So uh, let's get started right away and talk about Internal Resolve. Um, as you read in the description of the uh, of the song, of the piece of music, uh, this was inspired by the Ip Man film series. It's basically a Kung, Kung Fu uh, Chinese martial arts uh, franchise. And uh, it, it's basically my favorite like Kung Fu style uh, franchise. So the, the main theme is really, really cool. And it's quite epic, it's quite heroic in style, but it's not very traditional in terms of the music itself. It uses the natural minor scale, um, but it uses you know traditional Chinese instruments as well. Um, so the, the vibe we get off of it is very Asian and very triumphant. Um, and, and that's kind of the thing I wanted to channel into this piece as well. So definitely a very large source of inspiration in this piece. So uh, let's kind of get into it and I'll kind of talk about the chords uh, and the structure behind the piece. As you can see, it's basically separated into A, A prime, B, and A double prime, or you could just say A again if you want to. Um, so anyway, let, let's have a listen to it. Uh, by the way, it's in C minor, 4-4 four, four time, and uh, here's the chord structure. So C minor, then we go to the 6, then the 7, back to the 1. So very classic structure there. Then repeat the same thing. This time starting on the A flat, which is the 6, going to the 7, and then going to the E flat major. Now the E flat major there is uh, is interesting, right? Because you could have, I mean, I could have gone back to C minor there. I could have done the six, seven, one again, uh, which is quite common in natural minor. However, um, the the thing about doing the E flat is that. I actually wrote this down here. Uh, the A uses the natural minor scale, which is more regal and bold than harmonic minor. I made that note there. And I said, I enjoy turning the six, seven, one progression, uh, which is this one, A flat, B flat, C minor. Um, and I enjoy turning the six, seven, one progression into the four, five, one progression in the relative major. So in this case, A flat, B flat, C minor into A flat, B flat, and E flat major. So E flat major is the relative major of C minor, which just means uh, that E flat major and C minor share the same scale, share the same um, same key signature, same number of flats. And so uh, this A flat to B flat is not only the six and seven chords in C minor, but it's also the four and the five chords in E flat major. So naturally, you have two options. You can go back to the to the C minor chord there because if we do go to the C minor chord, then you hear it as the six seven one. But if we go to E flat major, then we hear it as the four five one in the relative major. And in this case, I wanted a more hopeful sound instead of going back to the sad, uh, you know, the C minor. I wanted to go to the, its relative major in this case, E flat major. So that's kind of how I wanted to end this first phrase. Um, then we do the same thing here. So we start the same way, A flat major, E flat, back to C minor. Now we're gonna change to C major before going to D flat. Right there. So you could hear that, right? It kind of goes from C minor. So what happens is the middle voice goes from E flat to E natural, then to F. You get this rise in chromaticism, and that's like chromaticism. I'm I'm a fan of when it comes to applying it in bits and pieces in your existing melodies and harmonies to make it a little more interesting. But like twelve tone music and and pieces where it like it goes serial and it it becomes like a science, like a like mathematical way of making music. Uh, I don't find it the most pleasing to listen to. I can appreciate the art that goes into it, um, but some chromatic music sounds completely atonal and it sounds a little bit outside of my realm. Uh, you know, that's how I can put it. So anyway, you have this kind of chromaticism going up, which turns the C minor into a C major chord, and then we go to D flat uh, major. And D flat major in the key of C minor is the flat two which is the Neapolitan chord. I'm gonna bold that here. The Neapolitan chord, which prepares the five chord coming up after that. 
D flat up to G. And this adds regality and spice to the chord progression. Cause I could have just done a D half diminished seven and go uh, and went up to the G, but it would have been more traditional. Flat two is a little bit more regal in my opinion. It sounds a little thicker and a little richer. So I like the flat two sound. And it's also cool because the flat two um, going to the five has this tritone relationship, right? So the D flat to the G is a is an augmented fourth or a diminished fifth. And that's kind of how it gets that almost um, surprising sound. You know, the D flat, we don't usually expect the flat two. So when it goes to the G, you're like, wow, okay. D flat up to G kind of sounds weird, but it works. So. Anyway, let's hear that in part again. So here's a D flat. And then we're gonna go up to the G. G is plus four, the C resolves down to the B. Here we go, repeat the A. So higher energy. Same chord progression so far. D flat to C minor. D flat major. Again, going to the relative major, so 4, 5, to 1 in E flat major. And then E flat major, again starting the same as this third line here. And then here, notice I did not go to C major this time, it stays on C minor. Then go to D flat major, flat 2 again. And this time I go up to D half the more sound. More traditional sound, then go to G, plus 4. So before we go to the bridge, I just want to show you here that the D half diminished 7 adds a little more interest and has a chromatic ascension from the D flat because D flat is just below D. So we get this D flat major chord. We go up a half step to a half diminished 7, which I love half diminished 7 chords because they have such an ambiguous but rich quality to them. And then they they res they um it's the 2 is a predominant chord, so it goes really, really well to the 5 chord, in this case, um, G sus4 or to G major. And then uh, basically here we're setting up an imperfect cadence or a half cadence where you're going from two to five and you would expect the resolution back to one. But in fact, we don't get that. We're actually going to right into the bridge and we're actually using the six chord. So we get a deceptive cadence instead of an authentic cadence. An authentic cadence would be just five to one. But in this case, we're going from five to six. Um, so it's, it's almost the five is like escaping to, you know, a note, a chord that's further away from one if you will. And it sounds kind of happy, which I like. So have a listen to this. So here you would expect, and then resolve back to C minor, but we go happy. And then six, seven, B flat major, C minor. And then we go back down to G minor, which allows the setup of the A flat again. So right there, this is uh, six, seven, one. Then we go down to G minor, which is actually the five chord, the, the natural five chord, the minor five. And five allows me to set up going back to the six again. So I could have just left it on C minor for both, uh, for both chords and then went back to A flat, but it's a little more sudden. So if I go to G minor, um, it keeps the momentum of changing one chord per bar and then also going to A flat is really, really smooth because G is just a half step below A flat. Okay, so I'm still staying diatonic, right? But now, instead of going up, we're now gonna start going down. So six, five minor, four minor, flat two, then to five. So we're going the opposite way. And then here's the climax, but let's uh, modulate. And that modulation, I just, honestly, when I was writing this piece, I, I didn't even have the modulation in mind until I got right to that chord, uh, the G sus4 to the G major. I was like, I could just repeat the A one last time and come up with an ending, but what if I raise the uh, raise the energy a little bit and actually bring everything, the dominant chord, up a half step? So now the piece is going to be in C sharp minor. And if you're familiar familiar with the circle of fifths and key signatures, then C minor is three flats on the circle of fifths, right? Three flats, so it's kind of at the ten o'clock position, or um, you know, nine o'clock, whatever. Um, and C sharp minor is four sharps. So that's all the way on the other side of the circle. And this is the relationship between half step keys. So like, it doesn't matter what key you're in, um, the half step above it or below it is going to be like on a completely different position on the circle. So it's really interesting. Um, but you know, in this case, 
we uh yeah we we went up a half step so we got to c sharp minor which has four sharps so the color completely changes but at the same time it doesn't sound too different doesn't sound like too out of the ordinary because again we're only going up one half step for everything but just the whole signature the whole tone of the piece changes a little bit because of this sudden shift in um in key signature from three flats which flats are a darker side then you go straight to the sharps and then sharps is is the more uh spicy a little more and exciting if you will um i like the sharp keys because they feel a little brighter to me whereas the flat keys are a little darker so i like going to the c sharp minor here and i play into that with the orchestration and the instrumentation i really bring everything in together and they really carry the brightness through use some more high instruments which we'll talk about in part two but let's have a listen here so so we have this descent again D flat Five chord, go up a half step to A flat minor. Technically, this should be G sharp minor. So this progression is the exact same as the A, but just up a half step. Now go down to F sharp minor, then to B, then to E. Now, really quickly, theoretically, um, I could have just went A B E because that would have been the exact same A flat, B flat, E flat, but just A, B, E. I put in the F sharp minor because that's actually the two chord in E major. So again, now we're thinking the four, five, one in E major, but I also wanted to hear kind of the two going to five to one. So the two chord and the four chord are both predominant chords and they both work very, very well before the five chord. So I kind of wanted to play with um, both of them. I wanted to start with the four chord and we kind of expect to go straight to the five because we've already heard it a few times going from four to five. So I wanted to add a bit more interest and instead of going to five right away, I drop down to the two and then go to the five and then go to the one. So you kind of get both predominant chords before getting this um, authenticated. So here it is. Going back to C sharp minor, so six chord to seven, C sharp minor, and then going down to the regular five, minor five, and then going to six. Same progression again, but now it's just the ending, and then Picardi third, which means ending on a major one. So Classic Picardi third to finish, which gives us hope. Right? So suddenly the, co the color changed from being more mournful and sad to suddenly being more hopeful because of that raised third. So we pulled the one chord from the parallel major, C sharp major, which makes the, the third, e, the E natural, come up to an E sharp. So that really gives us that extra bit of lift and happiness in there. And that's why... Um, a lot of Baroque music, especially Bach, J.S. Bach, used the Picardi third a lot, uh, just just to give you that extra sense of finality and hope, um, and you know that's kind of what I wanted to do here. So, yeah, a very simple piece. Uh, if you just like take a look at the chord structure, it's relatively simple. A couple of chords here and there. Um, I just threw in like this flat two, the Neapolitan chord, and then also this D half diminished seven to throw in the classic two five one, and then as well another two five one here. With the return of the A section, um, but other than that, pretty standard piece. Uh, here again, I just kind of go down the scale. So, um, in the key of C minor, that's the six chord, that's the five chord, that's the four chord. Oops, four chord. And then instead of going to the three chord, I go straight down to the two chord, the flat two, and then go to the five, and then you know rise up a half step. So it's the five in C sharp minor, and then we do the rest in C sharp minor. So one modulation to increase the energy and the emotion. Um, and I personally think it's effective and it makes it makes me feel better. It makes me feel uplifted and it makes me feel excited to hear what's coming next. So this is definitely one device you can definitely use um, occasionally to, to get this type of emotional effect, emotional response. Um, I did a complete uh, a, a set dedicated video on modulations and when you should use them and how to use them. Um, so check out that video in the description box below. I'll link that as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for watching. That's the theory part behind it. Uh, leave a comment and let me know uh, if you learned something from this video, what theoretical thing 
that um you know opened your eyes a little bit or maybe something you found interesting in this chord progression uh let me know and um in, in the next video we'll talk about the instrumentation behind the the piece and we'll get into the orchestration uh, but before you go i want to give you a, a gift and um, it's totally free um, it's basically my 10 steps to a clear orchestral sound these are kind of like my 10 go-to tips if people ask me how do i get a clear orchestral production in you know my music um because sometimes you know our, our productions sound kind of muddy and and not very rich and clear um, so arranging is a big thing to do with it. Mixing has to do with it. There's all these things that come together, but I've kind of condensed them into a PDF, um, covering my like 10 top tips that you need to know in order to get a clear orchestral sound. So, um, that's completely free in the description box below. Just download it and, uh, you can follow along for your next orchestral piece. Um, but in any case, I'll see you in the next video for the orchestration of internal resolve. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you then. Bye-bye.